we're going to look at different ways of dividing up substances into different categories and things like that. There are lots of different ways of doing it, um, but it helps us to often understand chemistry a bit better if we can put things into groups. So the first differentiation we're going to make is one that we made in grade 8, and it's the difference between a pure substance versus a mixture. We might have even done it in prep school. A pure substance has only got one kind of elementary particle in it. It doesn't mean it's only got one type of atom. It's got one type of elementary particle. And what is an elementary particle? An elementary particle is either an atom or a molecule or an ion. So in oxygen, there is a or oxygen, there is just oxygen in the container. Water, even though it is H2O, there are only H2Os in there, so it is pure H2O. If I take something like sodium chloride and I have only NaCl, then I have got pure sodium chloride. It is a pure substance. Mixtures are combinations of pure substances, and most substances around us appear as mixtures. Even something as simple as air is a mixture of oxygen and nitrogen predominantly and a few other things. And if we were to take the seawater, that's a mixture of water and various salts. Mixtures can either be homogeneous, homo means the same, and that means they're in the same phase. So, for example, air, even though these are two different things, they're in the same phase. And even when I dissolve sodium chloride into water, if you take salt and dissolve it into water, you can't see the difference. So it's a homogeneous mixture. A heterogeneous mixture is one where you can perceive the different phases. For example, sand in water. If you let it settle for a short while, it will separate into sand and water. Mixtures can be miscible. This word miscible means that they mix. Mixable. Um, but they mix into one another. And, um, for example, are introduced into water. And immiscible means they do not mix into each other. And that is something like oil and water. They're going to talk to you about physical properties and chemical properties of elements. Physical change and chemical change. So let's try and differentiate between those. These are quite important definitions over here. So physical properties are things that we can observe. So for example, it's color, it's um, texture, air, it's um, shape. Things like that are physical properties. Chemical properties, oh, so other physical properties are things like it's boiling point and it's melting point. We can observe those things. Chemical properties are how they react with another substance. So there has to be another substance involved for chemical change. Physical separation, no bonds are made or broken. So one of our classic physical separations is ice going to water going to steam. Now when I look at that, I notice that my pen isn't working very well. There we go, steam. Um, I can say that these were little water particles squashed together. These were little water particles slightly further apart. And these were little water particles very far apart. But the water particle itself has not changed. That is a physical change. It is not a chemical change. There was no other chemical that came into this. Chemical separation means I have to break or make some bonds. And we'll talk about that in a bit more detail later. An element is a pure substance that cannot be split into simpler substances. So elements are types of pure substances. Pure substances don't have to be elements, but elements are always pure substances. So sodium is an element. Chlorine is an element. A compound, however, consists of two or more elements combined in a fixed ratio. They're not just mixed together. They've been put together in exactly the right thing, and we've done this with the arms. We know because of their valency how many sodiums need to go with how many chlorines, Sodium has a valency of 1, chlorine has a valency of 1, so it's 1 sodium to 1 chlorine. It's a fixed ratio. A mixture can be physically separated into its constituent particles quite easily. So if I had sand and iron filings, I could perhaps bring a magnet in and take out the iron filings. This little animation, well not even, just little picture shows you the differences. So iron is an element, straight off the periodic table. Sulfur is an element, straight off the periodic table. Both of these are pure substances. I can then take iron and sulfur and mix them up into one container. And that is a mixture. I haven't broken or made any new bonds. They're just in the same container. 
Now, when I make a compound, in other words, I heat this and I actually get them the iron and the sulfur to make little bonds, that compound is also a pure substance. So atoms make molecules, and atoms and molecules are pure substances, whilst a mixture is just when they were sitting in the same container. A solution is a special type of uh, mixture. It is formed when I put a solvent into a solute. And you're supposed to know these words from primary school, but if you are a little bit confused, if I'm making a salt water solution, I can take um, salt um, and I will dissolve that. Sorry, salt is the solute and then water is my solvent. And when I put the salt into the water, I get a solution called salt water. A suspension is slightly different. It contains particles that can be seen and they'll eventually settle to the bottom like muddy water. An emulsion is when blobs of liquid are in another form of liquid. So one of, if you take salad dressing and you give it a good shake, the vinegar will make little blobs in among the oil and then they'll separate out again. While the blobs are all mixed up, you have an emulsion. So it's when tiny droplets of one liquid are spread evenly throughout another liquid. Another example is milk, and you're sitting there thinking, but milk is really one liquid. We have what is called homogenized milk. In other words, we've kind of tried to squish it, squash it together. If you are my age or your parents' age, you can ask them about how they used to get milk in a bottle, and you used to get full cream milk, and then the milk was in the bottle. I'm just going to try and draw a picture of milk in a bottle. And you would have milk mainly, and then at the top there would be a layer of cream. And you'd have to kind of shake your own milk to get the cream to mix in it. But actually, homogenized milk has got tiny little blobs of cream all the way distributed in the milk. We've talked about miscible and immiscible. Miscible liquids will mix fully. Immiscible liquids form layers, like oil and water. In order to separate immiscible liquids, we can use something called a separation funnel. That's what a separation funnel looks like. Okay, so it's got this um, lid at the top. You pour the two immiscible liquids in there. They form a layer, and you land up with this nice kind of meniscus over there and a meniscus over there. And then using this tap, you can tap off the first layer, and then you stop it perfectly over there, and then you can grab whatever is in the second layer. So, for example, that could be oil, that could be water, and you could separate them out using a separating funnel. I could, in a test or an exam, start giving you diagrams of various types of equipment that you would have to be able to label. So, if this was oil and water, you, I think, should know that oil floats on water. So, oil's at the top and water is at the bottom. I may also ask you to label some of the apparatus. So this over here would be a separating funnel. This over here would be a conical flask. This over here would be a retort stand. And you are expected to have kept this kind of information in your brain cell since grade 8. Okay, This is actually called a ring boss head, but you don't have to really know that one. Physical properties also often allow us to separate different substances from another, one another, such as their melting point, boiling points, color, density, can let us do this. Can you think of ways of separating different quality fruit? Well, you can hand pick them. The icky fruit you put on one side and the lacquer fruit you put on the other side using your hands. This is known as hand sorting. It's very expensive though because it requires this thing called a human being and that's a problem. How can iron filings and sand be separated? Well, iron filings are magnetic. And sand is not magnetic, so you can use a magnet to pull out the iron filings. How could sand and sugar be separated by using the solubility of one substance? Sugar will dissolve in water. And therefore, you can dissolve the, both of them, well, try to dissolve both of them in water, the sand won't dissolve, the sugar will. You can then filter them apart. The sugar goes off with the water and the sand stays behind. 
You could then evaporate off the water if you wanted to. This is just a cute picture of a whole lot of different density atoms um, and how they, what's more dense and what's less dense. So the ping pong ball, ball is the least dense, then lamp oil, rubbing alcohol, vegetable oil. This is plastic. Then you've got these little plastic beads, a different type of plastic. Water, a tomato, which is kind of halfway between water and soap. Milk. There's a little dice in here, <laughs> but you can't see it. Um, syrup, maple syrup versus corn syrup. There's a little popcorn kernel in the middle of that, some honey, and a bolt sitting made of iron at the bottom. Let's say I was trying to separate um, two substances that one dissolved in water and the other one did not. So you could have a stirring rod. This thing over here is a beaker. These things are called bumping stones. You didn't, don't really need to know them. I'd have to tell you something about them. They help to stir the solution while you're busy heating it and distribute the heat nicely. This thing's a tripod. This is a Bunsen burner. Okay, then you're going to put them through filter paper and some of the stuff will have dissolved and some of the stuff won't. These are just two different ways of um, folding filter paper. If you think about it for a second, which one's going to work best? It's going to be this one over here with the fan mechanism because what we have created is like the villa inside our intestines, there is more surface area over here for the liquid to move on through. Here it's going to take much longer because you've got much less surface area. You've lost half this filter paper to this big fat fold. Whilst these little folds give you a much better surface area. And then what you would do is you would put, let's just do some labeling again here. So you'll pour them through, you will pour the mixture into the filter funnel with the filter paper in it. What it stays behind is called the residue goes into a conical flask because it looks like an upside down ice cream cone and what comes through is called the filtrate. Over here is an evaporating dish and your evaporating dish goes onto a gauze mat. When you label things like this don't forget that you use rulers, you then bring all your lines to one place, it's difficult to do on a tablet, tripod and Bunsen burner. Then all of the liquid burns off, blah, 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 and you're left behind with, let's say, the sugar from the very beginning. So the sand would have been the residue, and the sugar is left behind here. How can alcohol and water be separated? So this thing here is called a Liebig condenser, and um, you can put, if you put steam in there, it has cold water running around over here, and it will drip out, the, it will condense the steam into water. These two waters don't mix, by the way. The cold water is just about cooling the whole thing down, and what goes on inside the funnel is something quite, quite different. So this is an inner tube, and this is called the outer jacket. It's a water jacket. You put cold water in, up it goes, and warm water goes out all the time. So that's your Liebig condenser, and we could use it to separate, let's say, salt and water. The water would come through the Liebig condenser, the salt would stay behind as a residue. But what about alcohol and water? You can put a thermometer into a flask, and then what happens is the first thing to boil off will be the lower boiling point substance. Then all the energy is given to that to allow it to come and boil over. And alcohol boils at some 60 something, I don't know, let's call it 63 degrees. And water, as you know, boils at 100 degrees. So what will happen is the temperature will sit at 63 degrees. And all that time you would be collecting alcohol over here. And then going through the Liebig condenser, so it becomes vapor, becomes alcohol vapor, comes down over here, gets cooled, and you get alcohol liquid. As soon as the temperature moves up towards 100, you move that conical flask, and you use another conical flask to collect all the water, which will be at 100 degrees. That is called fractional distillation. Fractional distillation. Fractional distillation is used to refine oil. They bring in the crude oil, which is the muck that comes out the ground, and then they heat it up. And what they do is they have different temperatures over here. So something that has a very, very um, 
it boils very easily. We'll go up to the top and 20 degrees coming off there. But the ones that ha have a lot of difficulty boiling are heavy. They stay now near the bottom and that's where you collect your oils and your, um, sorry, your lubricating oils, fuel oils. And then these are the other fractions of petrol. Bitumen is the goo that is left behind at the end. What do we use oil for? Well, it's just, I mean, it's fossil fuels, the most useful stuff out under the sun, but at the same time, it's contributing to our big fat problem, carbon dioxide, which is contributing to climate change. Some people call it global warming, um, but the point is it's a pollution and it's a problem. So um, it can be used in mining. Well, you have to mine it first. You have to get the crude oil out of the ground. You then have to refine it. In other words, make it useful. Turn it either into petrol or into diesel or into propane for a gas stove, if you've got a gas stove in your home, you use a part of crude oil, you can use it for petrol, you can use it for paraffin lamps, and then the bitumen gets used as tar on the road.